time to unleash the greatest moments of Game of Thrones. The best thing I've ever seen on television. As chosen by you. A crown for king. From a treasure trove of epic scenes. I got goosebumps, actually. Across seven explosive seasons. My TV is coming alive! The feuding families. The Lannisters and the regards. And cataclysmic vengeance. These women are much more powerful than the men. Everybody has a motivation to kill. Villain or hero. Characters very quickly taken out. Death comes for all. You're dead, you're dead, you're dead. This perfect poetic justice. As ice and fire unite. Wow, that is an intense scene. The end game is in sight. She's hardcore. Who will claim the throne? It's about survival, it's about power, it's about revenge. The results have landed. So don't even blink. I didn't see that coming. As we reveal your greatest moments. I love this show. I was watching, thinking like there's like the fires burning, candlelight. I was thinking this is good. At number 25, it's Melisandre's big bedtime reveal. That was one of the best twists. I did not expect that. I didn't expect it at all. The Red Priestess has been hot property in Westeros. For the night is dark and full of terrors. I truly believe that she believes in the Lord of Light. She, she's 100%. She's got this blind faith, and that's why we like her. That's why I like her. She's enticed the powerful to reach out and touch faith. She's always used her sexuality to manipulate men. Stannis was so bewitched, he sanctioned a terrible sacrifice. Stuff that she's doing is grimbo, like nasty. Now, in this moment, we see the beauty is facade, but the magic is ancient and very real. She takes off the red dress, and we're thinking, OK, where, where are we going with this? And then she takes off the necklace. And you see her reflection change in the mirror. What happened to the beautiful red-headed Melisandre? She's got this young figure, but behind that, she's actually a very old woman that's been, a, that's been alive for many, many years, believing in this god. However, I feel like that scene kind of showed us she was starting to lose faith. Not being ageist, of course, and obviously uh, old people should have sex, but <laughs> it makes you wonder, like, all, she's getting sexy with all these young men. They can't seem to resist her, can they? Um, apart from Jon Snow. Undoubtedly a more powerful character with that aspect. Um, that she can manipulate what she looks like and how she appears to people. She's like a huge wealth of experience and so much magic that she can make herself incredibly beautiful. That's very powerful. You don't know what she'd do with someone else. And that's pretty terrifying because she can have that power over anyone. You felt quite scared. You felt like, what's happened here? And cheated, cheated of the of the, the glory moment that we were all hoping to see. Bran is the fire lighter who started the, the raging fire. Next up at 24 is Bran Stark's downfall. Climbed that tower against his mother's wishes. He was this happy-go-lucky kid who just liked sort of living around the castle and, and being outdoors. Everything went pear-shaped after that. It's beautifully paced in that you know he's going to find something at the top of this tower and eventually comes across a scene that a young man should not see. Being a 10-year-old boy, I don't know if I quite grasped perhaps the intensity of the scene back then. You can see that Jamie's having sex with somebody, but then you kind of think that it must just be some wench that he's picked up from Winterfell, and then eventually her, 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 her face is shown, and it's his sister. And the strange thing about it, he's this sugary character, but he's sleeping with his sister. 
At least I didn't see any of it while we were filming. Stop! But, stop! Yeah, you suddenly got that the, these were strange people. Are you completely mad? He saw us. It's all right, it's all right, it's all right. He saw us! I heard you the first time. You know, Game of Thrones, incest, violence, whatever, it's, it's sort of not normal, but it's sort of, you know, the, the, the language of the programme now. But at the time, certainly it was... It was hugely shocking. We were steaming right ahead into all those taboos um, and we completely shatter them and the dance on them. Quite the little climb, aren't you? How old are you, boy? Ten. Ten. Jamie is trying to please his sister. She's in a complete panic, the fact that Bran has seen him because she knows what it means, but he knows what it means too, and he knows that if the the incest is discovered, uh, not only will he and his sister be put to death, but the, their three children may very well, too. It's a measure of the lengths the Lannisters are prepared to go to to uh, achieve their, their goals, which, you know, they'll do whatever it takes. I think it's a, a fantastic moment because it sets up the tone of Game of Thrones so well. In a conventional drama, Jamie might cuff Bran round the ear and say, go away, don't tell anyone about this. But no, what he does is far more shocking. And he does it almost with a punchline. The things I do for love. <laughs> there's no remorse. You know, there's just this relish. A sinner comes before you. Cersei of House Lannister. It was schadenfreude, wasn't it? Cersei and the walk of shame. And what an awful haircut. At 23, it's Cersei's great come down as she fights to hold on to her son. She lost Tommen to Marjorie. Take her. <sighs> Hell bent on destroying Marjorie, Cersei empowers High Sparrow and his religious fanatics to help. I am the queen. Tommen! Tommen! In order to get Tommen back, she wanted to pretty much destroy Marjorie. But she is sealing her own fate too. It's like Danton Abbey on acid. Bad choice. Very bad choice, bad deal. Terrible move. It was a really, really bad gamble. What will we find when we strip away your finery? And because she's dealing with people of faith, then they can't be bought. And now comes a greater foe than Marjorie as they bring out the big nuns to make Cersei confess to affairs out of wedlock. The Walk of Atonement took four days in total in Dubrovnik Old Town. To demonstrate her repentance, she will cast aside all pride. Who would have thought we would have felt sorry for Cersei until the Walk of Shame, which was heart-wrenching. It was very, very tough for her. Very few women could have done what she did, complete that walk. I felt complete sympathy for her. And, and thought, to my, and, and I felt absolutely zero satisfaction in in her walk of shame. It's such a such a sexualized form of humiliation, and one that you know would really bother Cersei the most of all. Ultimately, to watch Cersei's downfall, oh, I mean, talk about moving and shocking. Shame. It was really, really an extraordinary piece of television. Shame. 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 You really did feel for her there. Shame. Absolute power at the beginning to, you know, to being really fragile and, and humbled on the streets. Shame. Her subjects, the people in the city that she completely despises, has no respect for, get their own back. I hadn't expected to find it so harrowing. Shame. And people coming out of nowhere, chucking themselves at you. Shame. 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 And of course we had to do every section twice because we had Lena acting it and then we had a girl called Rebecca who was her body double. Bless her. Shame. It has to go on and on and on. This is not a short punishment. They just had pots and pots of <laughs> horrific bodily fluids. 
And you just thought, my God, that really looks really. Are you sure that hasn't been contributed to in some way? <laughs> I think one of the reasons it makes it such a standout scene is because it is utterly relentless. Not the typical violence, you know, a, a different kind of emotional violence against a character that we, 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 we've, we've gotten used to loathing and then, and then suddenly we want to save her from that. And you see her trying to maintain this regal presence, but she can't. <laughs> She's bruised, she's cut, she's covered in spit and fruit and shit. It's a proper, proper destroying of a character. When we reach the Red Keep and I'm stopped and she carries on, you can feel... I, I just thought she was brilliant the way she played it. They were so tight in on her. And the way you just see her finally breaking down, breaking down as she reaches that door. It's good to have you back. <laughs> and then, boom, the twist at the end. In comes Mega Mountain Zombie Man. I felt complete satisfaction when she was swept up into the arms of my own killer. Cersei Lannister has been for a long time my favourite character on Game of Thrones. I don't judge it by whether the character's a goodie or a baddie. I judge it by, I can't wait to see that character on screen again. What's in there? Fuck off. Charming. And we'll have more great moments from the Seven Kingdoms after the break. That's when you realise nobody is safe. Welcome back to Game of Thrones Greatest Moments, as voted for by you, the fans. At number 22, it's the moment that redefined TV drama and stunned us all. It was at that moment you realised what Game of Thrones was really about and what risks the show was willing to take to kind of entertain and torment their audience. Wrongly accused of treason and aware that Sansa has struck a deal to save his life, Ned, for once, puts honour aside and throws himself on the mercy of the king. My mother wishes me to let Lord Eddard join the Night's Watch. Stripped of all titles and powers, he would serve the realm in permanent exile. And my lady Sansa has begged mercy for her father. He does do what he has been suggested to him, and that is that he does confess to treason. Although it sticks in his craw, obviously, but he does do it. Because he's been given reason to believe that if he does that, okay, he may end up in the wall, but he will not be killed. But then he didn't reckon with Joffrey. Sir Illyn, bring me his head. <laughs> The title of it should be Don't Get Too Fond of Anybody. <laughs> Nobody knew, not even Cersei, knew what Joffrey was going to do there. And that's the power of drama, basically. Now that Joffrey's in power, you see that there's a whole shift in this Game of Thrones. This is the person now in control, and he doesn't have mercy, and his, even his mum can't control him. When he actually says, give me his head, that's when his mother goes potty. And that's when he really revels in the discomfort that he has caused every other single person in that square. And no one is more distraught than Ned's youngest daughter, Arya, who bears witness to the horrific scene from agonisingly close by. She's very brave, she does want to look. You know, her sister Sansa's crying, and, but she is just staring at her dad, willing it not to be. Put him down! Her desire to save her father with direct action, uh, you know, is really part of her character. And of course, defines her, at least in that moment, from her sister, who had also tried to save her father, but by negotiation. The children are trying to stop this happening, and it's not going to stop. It just brings a, a much more human aspect to a very barbaric scenario. Once you've got Ellen Pine walking up the steps towards you, that's it. You think, well, there's going to be something. There'll be someone. Someone will shout something. Arya's going to get there. There'll be something, definitely. Stop it! 
This is not a, you know, a Robin Hood movie here where three guys are going to swing over the fence and beat the, the 37 guardsmen who are surrounding the, the merry man who's about to be hung. I try to be a little more realistic than that. That's when you realize nobody is safe in this world at all. It's very brave. You know, they're not afraid of killing off some of the best characters. The birds take to the air, and you know, just the way it was filmed, it was it was tremendously powerful. That was the only scene uh, that that really has brought a tear to my eye. That was the worst TV experience <laughs> of my life up to that point. Um, Game of Thrones has given me at least three or four more <laughs> of those. What's in there? Fuck off. The whole setup in the Dragon Pit was so very, very well executed. It was absolutely wonderful. What I really liked about it was right before the summit when all the characters reunited. At 21, Cersei's foes come en masse to meet her. All these amazing, disparate characters, and this is the first time they're all being brought together. How's it going? I've not seen you for ages. I'm glad you're still alive. I never thought I'd see you again, my lord. Supporting the enemy, no less. It's nice to see people who had tried to kill people and people who had other people tried to kill people and people who, oh, I know about you, we, well, you tried to kill, uh, uh, we'll talk about it later. Innit? My favorite moments were the Hound and Brienne meeting. Thought we were dead. Not yet. Two warriors kind of acknowledging each other. She's alive. Oh, yeah. And having a lovely little shared moment about their murder baby. The only one that needs protecting is the one that gets in her way. She's doing fine. Still murdering? Yeah. Proud of her. Every moment is full of tension. You don't know what's going to happen. You're waiting for the ambush by Cersei. You have all these reunions from different sides. Good ones, bad ones. It was just so well set up. Brianna Tuff and Jamie Lannister. That was another nice moment. I love it when Brianna Tuff and Jamie share a look. I am firmly on Team Brainy. The hind meeting the mind then. Remember me? Yeah, you do. I liked how he went up to his brother and just thought he just immediately knew. He said, yeah, you're, you're uglier than me now, aren't you? What do they do to you? Yeah, you're, you're, you're gonna get it. Where is she? She'll be here soon. Cersei and Daenerys coming face to face for the first time. That's, you know, the clash of titans. She was late. Everyone is expecting her to come in a different way, but she gets on one of her dragons and she swans in on the dragon as if to say, hey, I'm here, look at me, you know, I am the queen. You could tell she really hates it when Danny comes in on the dragon. She's like, <sighs> she looks at it like it's a little bit tacky. She was always gonna turn up on a dragon. If you have a pet dragon, you're gonna land, you're gonna, you're gonna drive it into the pit. We've been here for some time. And she makes Daenerys apologize to her. <laughs> nice opening move. My apologies. It was always gonna be difficult when Daenerys and Cersei kind of got together. But acidic greetings are swiftly forgotten when the allies play their show-stopping hand, presenting Cersei with hard evidence of the true peril, asking her to join them to help fight it. I didn't expect it, A, to be there, or it to still be alive. And then when, when the hand kicked the box, <laughs> it just started running out. That was wicked. It is the visceral payoff that we've all been waiting for. I mean, she remains fairly cool considering the zombie looked like it was about to eat her. The hound, who is this huge arsehole, is not scared of anyone. He didn't want to go anywhere near it. The hound sort of goes White Walker, throws the White Walker out, chops the White Walker in half. <laughs> And then Jon Snow comes out and gives like a, like a White Walker TED talk. He's like, we can destroy them with flames. It just gave like this nice little demonstration of how to take out these wipes. And we can destroy them with dragon glass. Well, while this one is like Terminator, like half its body on the floor. 
face proved. Now it's over to Cersei. Even when she stares face to face with an undead creature, can that be enough to get her to move off of her own personal agenda? There is only one war that matters. The Great War. And it is here. At number 20, it's the moment fans had been waiting for since the birth of those little fire breathers. Daenerys finally takes to the skies on Drogon Airways. On the back of a dragon has always been the symbol of the Targaryens coming to claim their power. Ever since those eggs hatched, we just knew that one day she was going to get on the back of a dragon and fly off and cause havoc. Throughout Game of Thrones, there is one love story that has gripped us all. One girl and her dragons. They both start as innocence, really. And then they inevitably get bigger and scarier and bolder and braver, and you wouldn't want to cross either of them. Dragon. She, of course, who thinks that Drogon is beyond her control now, suddenly they're reunited, which is an incredibly powerful moment. And Drogon doesn't let her down when she's facing almost certain death during a civil rebellion in Marine. And you think, she's done for. But there's a little bit of you going, but she does have a dragon somewhere. And woof, in he comes. I think for every viewer, we've been waiting for that, to see those dragons used to their full force. Classic kind of from the jaws of defeat. Daenerys has had these dragons for quite some time now. But that moment that she gets onto Drogon and rides him for the first time, that is her, more than anything we've seen her do so far, that is her claiming her birthright. Vla. Who doesn't get chills when they see that moment? And all of a sudden, and she's flying off. Huh, yeah, it's classic. Who wouldn't want to fly off in a dragon, let's be honest. <laughs> The dragon riders are what the Targaryens are all about. That is how they wielded their power. She's coming to her own, this powerful woman. She gets on one of her dragons and she's a ruler, queen of the dragons. She's a dragon rider. She became true to her name. She was a fully fledged Targaryen at that point. It was brilliant to watch and it was just exciting to think. Is she gonna get to go to King's Landing with, <laughs> with these dragons and just like wreak havoc? This was the showdown to end all showdowns. In Westeros, you can't get family therapy, can you? The purest form of conflict resolution is to kill your dad. At number 19, it's the nerve jangling showdown between Tyrion and his father, who not only sentenced him to death for a crime he didn't commit, he also slept with the woman he loved. Tyrion. Put down the crossbow. I think it's very significant that he's on the toilet. It sums up that he's trapped and he's vulnerable. No guards in the loo. Not where you're sitting having a crap. There's no guards around. But it's very humiliating for him as well. It's a private moment. This is how you want to speak to me? Hmm? Shaming your father has always given you pleasure, hasn't All it? All my life, you've wanted me dead. Yes. But you refuse to die. I respect that. He lives with a conundrum all the time. This tyrant. I'd never let them execute you. Is that what you fear? Because it's very apparent that of his three children, Tyrion is the most compassionate, the most humane, and the most intelligent. You're a Lannister. You're my son. It's so tightly wound, this scene, because Tyrion's obviously, he's at the end of his rope. What's brilliant about him, he's so well portrayed, you can see yourself doing this. I loved her. Who? She. Not Tyrion. Put down that crossbow. I murdered her. With my own hands. 
Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. She was a whore. And Taiwan was like, who? The whore? And, you know, still insulting him, you know, doesn't respect him and his love. We'll go back to my chambers and speak with some dignity. I can't go back there. She's in there. Are you afraid of a dead whore? <laughs> Tywin really has had it coming to him. The audience is expecting some kind of payback. You shot me. And the fact that that payback is at the hands of Tyrion with a crossbow, it's kind of right and proper. I think Tyrion's sitting on years and years and years and years of anger and uh, frustration and resentment. And then, uh, after he's been shot by the first arrow, Tywin's true colours come out. You're no son of mine. I am your son. I have always been your son. When he releases that arrow, he releases everything into him. It's really so silent, so powerful. While sitting on the lavatory, what a way to go. It's a great death scene, I have to say. <laughs> Coming up, a quest for power which is boiling point. Viserys has to be the most deluded, arrogant character in the history of TV. Daddy, please! Welcome back to our countdown of the 25 greatest moments of Game of Thrones, as decreed by your good selves. At number 18, it's season two's epic battle of Blackwater, and Tyrion's tactic of wiping out the opposition in one fell swoop has almost worked. But with King's Landing still under siege, it's time for him to step up and rally the beleaguered troops. In that kind of world, as a man, you have to be tall and strong and powerful. And he's powerful, but in a different way. You know, he's fighting with his mind more than with his sword. Prepare to land. Your grace, the dwarf has played his little trick. I think in Game of Thrones, what it shows is that anything can happen to anyone. You have handsome princes who are the best swordsmen, get their hands cut off. You have children who are thrown from the top of towers. And here you have Tyrion, who is always seen as a half man and mocked, finally have this heroic moment. They say I'm half a man, but what does that make the lot of you? He doesn't look like a warrior. He doesn't look like a kingmaker. There's no way that he could assume the position of, of Tywin. But then Tyrion demonstrates that he has enormous courage. He was the best person to speak to the people of King's Landing and to get them to protect their, 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 their city because he knows what it's like to fight. He knows what it's like to have your back up against the wall. The only way out is through the gates. And they're at the gates. There's another way out. I'm going to show you. Come out behind them and fuck them in their asses. First of all, it's incredibly brave. He doesn't have to fight. There's no expectation of him to fight because of his disability. He steps forward and says, I am but half a man, but here I am standing up beside you. That's what I think a, like a once more into the breach speech would really be like. They're not gonna follow him if he shows weakness and he wants to prove himself as a strong man leading an army. So he has to put on a, a, a good face in order to lead the army. He's good at talking, isn't he? That's Tyrion's thing. He could talk himself out of any situation and he could sell anything to anybody. Don't fight for your king and don't fight for his kingdoms. He's always got an intelligent thing to say to somebody uh, or, or a joke to make. Don't fight for honor, don't fight for glory. Don't fight for riches because he won't get any. We don't expect to see him the leader, we expect to see him making kind of wry comments at the side, but, but, but suddenly, wow, it's, it's him. If he gets in, it will be your houses he burns. Your gold he steals. Your women he will rape. I was lucky enough to be right next to him when he was doing it. And I don't know how many times we, we, we shot it and reshot it, but every time Peter did it, it was incredible when he says these words that i wrote for Tyrion, it, it's it's just like i pictured them in my head just like i heard them in my head when i was writing them there's our brave men knocking at our door let's go kill them <laughs> Oh 
When I saw that, I was like, wow, I want to fight with him as well. <laughs> he was really good. Daenerys! And number 17 fits a golden oldie from season one, as Viserys gets his reward for trading his sister for an army in order to reclaim the Iron Throne. Go on, feel the fabric. He's basically pimped out his sister. And he's quite proud of that. Daenerys was this innocent girl who was protected, <laughs> but not um, sold, actually, by her brother. She's the only bargaining chip he has. He doesn't have any wealth anymore. He doesn't have any armies, but he has her, who he can trade to this horse lord. Khal Drogo's army. I would let his whole tribe fuck you. All 40,000 men and their horses, too, if that's what it took. It was horrible to her, probably her entire life. Um, and she would never be, she, she never would have turned into who she did unless he was dealt with. Much to her brother's dismay, Daenerys and Drogo end up getting on rather well and she becomes pregnant with his son. Jealous, desperate and drunk, Viserys finally decides to call in his debt. Daenerys! Viserys has to be the most deluded arrogant character in the history of TV. I mean, why would you start a fight with Khal Drogo, of all people? The man is huge, and it's in his tent, and all his friends are around, so you're never going to win. Keep away from me! Viserys, please. Very often you get a scene like, like this, where you think, oh, right, OK, uh, it's all about to go horribly wrong. It's normally when someone asks for something they, they can't have, and Viserys is asking for the thing he will never be allowed to have, which is to be king. Everybody wants the power of rulership, um, of being a king or queen. Tell him I want what was bargained for or I'm taking you back. And all the time we're being asked that question, who would make a good ruler? He can keep the baby. I'll cut it out and leave it for him. She's realizing and feeling this inner strength inside of her. He just completely underestimates not only Danny, but Khal Drogo. What do you say? He says yes. You shall have a golden crown that men shall tremble to behold. She's really beginning to find this is my role, this is who I'm married to, and this is where I'm going, and Viserys is not part of this journey. I think this is when you realize that she's prepared to sacrifice anything for the greater good. There was nothing more satisfying than seeing Khal Drogo play along with him and just say, you know, um, well, t you know tell him, yes, tell him he can have it. Just to see Viserys' face. Well, that was all I wanted. <laughs> what, what was promised? The stillness in him and the knowing is petrifying. He has all of the strength and he knows exactly what he's gonna do. You don't exactly see it coming, but you know something pretty bad's gonna happen. It's actually probably the most gruesome death in the Hall of Game of Thrones, which is really saying something. Look away, Khaleesi. No. Daenerys shows absolutely no remorse. She absolutely despises him, and there is no love lost between them. She watched him die, and I'm not going to say she enjoyed it, but he deserved it. A crown for king. It's brutal. Even the noise he makes as he lands, I can hear it now. I love that sound as well. He goes, dunk. His head hits the floor. <laughs> it's so good. It's almost been like the Night Kings have planned this. They have waited for the dragons for this very moment. And also, poor little dragon. Number 16, it's a moment we thought could never happen. Daenerys and her precious dragons have ventured beyond the wall to rescue Jon Snow. You know, she wants to go and, and, and help him and, and fight. He and his band of men are surrounded by the Night King and his army of the dead. One of his generals just sort of hands him this almost like a javelin. 
But it's like, yeah, cheers, mate, for that spear. The Night King is so calm. This is why he's so scary. We've learned to love those dragons because we've seen them from these little tiny babies who were just hanging out on Daenerys' shoulder. And then she finally gets them to these monsters. You kind of think nobody was going to be able to kill a dragon. Don't kill the dragon. It just seemed really easy for him to just kill the dragon. He just got this, he got that spear set up and lined it up, and that was it, gone. I'm sure Daenerys' heart just drops. I thought it was amazing to see and really sad. Yeah, it was horrendous. <laughs> We've seen the dragon since they were like, you know, really young. And they feel so sad when they see him disappearing. He just went down and he saw the eye close and Daenerys, she felt it. It was heartbreaking. You really feel for the dragon. And you think, right, well, we won't see him again. Oh, you do. I didn't even think about him then turning the dragon. It was only when the dragon was being pulled out of the ice, I was like, well, of course now, because now we can turn it. the Night King killing this dragon. And then bringing it back to life in order to kill. There was another moment where I kind of looked at the Night King and was just like, yeah, this guy's a real problem. This dragon has gone over to the dead side. When Viserion reveals the blue eye, you kind of figure something's going to happen. I find the White Walkers very interesting. What do they want? Why they've been dormant for such a long time and suddenly they're starting to come out of their zone. You've got a wall that I think has been standing for 8,000 years. I still thought that there would be a battle to be had at the wall. No battle, just demolition. Swift and icy. And then you hear something. Well, for me, it was obvious that he then was going to be riding it. He gets, he's the Night King, he gets dibs on the dragon. He didn't show much emotion, the Night King, because he doesn't show any emotion, but I know deep down he was like, awesome, I hate horseback. Ah, oh, yeah, <laughs> woo! That took that wall down fast. <gasps> wow. The dragons would appear to be the ultimate weapon. Oh, that's just changed the whole ball game here. When that happened, you thought, oh yes, this takes us on a whole different journey now. Wow, I'll breathe. <gasps> Come back for more trial and retribution after the break. I almost cried. You're watching Game of Thrones Greatest Moments, as voted for by you, the fans. It's the first time that we really see Daddy take control. You, re you start to see, like, you know, proper badass Danny. At 15, it's the mind-blowing moment Daenerys completes her transformation from innocent girl to warrior queen. All by stepping into Khal Drogo's funeral pyre, along with three dragon eggs. She has just burned one of her enemies, but it underlines Daenerys' uh, newfound uh, ruthlessness and um, willingness to wield her power. <laughs> At 
at the point in which she walks into the fire, she has no family left. So she's lost her brother, her husband, she's lost her, her child, and she's made a decision, and she's like, it's almost her walking into her, like, destiny, I guess. She, like, in cold blood, really, strapped that, strapped the witch, and completely emotionless, watched her scream, and I think she quite enjoyed it. I think that showed that she is a, a force to be reckoned with. Obviously, walking into the fire, it looks suicidal, and in a way, a, a part of her is dying, her innocence is dying. I think there's a possibility she's walking into her death. I think if you've watched the show closely, there are moments, even from early on, when she's in a really hot bath water where she doesn't feel anything. When she sees her brother die by having molten gold poured on his head, she's actually quite scornful. He was no dragon. Fire cannot kill a dragon. Even though you suspect she might live, you don't suspect that dragons are suddenly going to come out of it. I thought for a split second she was going to turn into a dragon. <laughs> but um, of course she was going to make it. Thanks to the Targaryen dragon blood running through her veins, Daenerys survives the inferno. And when she rises from the ashes, she's not alone. What was very important when we were staging that scene is that these creatures are extraordinary creatures, the likes of which have not been seen in hundreds of years. And so when they're born and you see that look on Ian Glenn, who plays Jorah Mormont's face, that look of just astonishment. And it's as if the dinosaurs were roaming the earth again. It's as if you and I saw, you know, a Tyrannosaurus Rex, just <laughs> right there. That's, that's what this is. It drops hints all the way along that, you know, the dragons are the real, where the real power lies. So when they emerge, you know that this is gonna change everything forever. I was on set for some of those scenes that we filmed in Malta. It's all done with computer animation, so I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing Amelia acting out these scenes with like a green tennis ball and a stick. But uh, seeing them when the CGI wizards had gotten hold of them, crawling over her shoulder and all that, it was, it was perfect. Yeah. Blood of my blood. They're frolicking on her naked body. Um, three of them, clearly her children. You couldn't get uh, a more powerful emblem of the strength of this woman, and that's why all the men bow down in front of her. You don't see if she's naked or not, because you just see the power and the pride in her eyes. It was such a powerful scene um, to see her standing there with her clothes have been burnt away, she's completely unharmed, her beautiful little baby dragons. You know, it was a powerful moment. You see this adult woman in the most vulnerable position, but with this growing strength from inside, and, and ev everything's been left behind. It's been burned away. They worship her. When she's with the dragons, she is the mother of dragons, and a pretty scary one. It was just as powerful watching it in the flesh as it was seeing it back on screen. It's such a difficult scene to watch because I love Tyrion. I mean, he's one of the good guys. He is the good guy. <laughs> it was so emotional. We, all of us, should feel guilty what we have done and what we are doing to him. It's the trial of the century. Tyrion Lannister, wrongly accused of regicide, is about to take a deal which would save his life but see him living out his days at the wall. But then the prosecution wheels out its star witness. I almost cried. I didn't really, I didn't want to do it. This man stands accused of murdering King Joffrey. What do you know of this? I know that he's guilty. He and Sansa planned it together. Silence! Well, it's completely unjust, of course, you know. None of the audience believes for a minute that Tyrion is responsible for Joffrey's death. I talked to, to the producers and I said, please, could you just change it somehow? She really loved Tyrion. And now she's there and lying. I was his whore. I beg your pardon? You said you were his... His whore. I cried in that season. I get emotional just thinking about it because seeing her come in and betray him like that and calling herself a whore when, 
you know that she's so much more than that to him is so difficult. She. Please don't. I am a whore. Remember? For Tyrion, his lover's betrayal is too much to bear. It triggers an outburst which leaves the court and us reeling. Do you admit you poisoned the king? No. Of that I'm innocent. I'm guilty of a far more monstrous crime. I'm guilty of being a dwarf. You are not on trial for being a dwarf. Oh, yes I am. I've been on trial for that my entire life. It's absolutely right. That is what it's about. He finally has an opportunity and an audience to address what everyone has been thinking about him his whole life. And, you know, here's a man who risked his life for these people, who's always fought against the prejudice that he faces from his family, probably from everybody that he meets. And he's innocent. I did not do it. I did not kill Joffrey, but I wish that I had. Watching your vicious bastard die gave me more relief than a thousand lying whores. Seeing him at last saying what he really thought, which we know he must have been thinking for the whole of his life. And to hear him doing that at that scene was almost orgasmic to watch. I wish I was the monster you think I am. I wish I had enough poison for the whole pack of you. I would gladly give my life to watch you all swallow it. Zimmerin! It's so moving and it's so powerful. It just sort of pours out of Peter's heart. Um, and it's an amazing, amazing moving scene. At number 13, it's the moment that had fans obsessing for a year over the fate of one of Westeros's greatest heroes. Jon Snow is one of my favourite characters. He's, he's the dude. He's the ultimate good guy, the guy who's fought so much, who's loved and lost, who has maintained his honour, his dignity. A lot of people watch it for Jon Snow's stories. I think Jon Snow's one of the most likeable characters in the show. He's the most likely for a teenage girl to have as a poster. He's the one direction of, um, of Westeros. I feel like he is a good leader and that everyone should, should listen to what he says. But not only did they not listen to him, they turned on him for making a deal with the wildlings. The fact that he's done that and he's gone against like all the Night's Watchmen that have died over the years defending the wall, the core of them are hurt by that and they wanted to see him suffer. They, they see him as a traitor, which, which you see. If it was the 50th episode of Game of Thrones, we should have known better than to think that Jon Snow was safe. When I saw the cross with traitor written on him, I thought, oh, no, this isn't going to happen, is it? They're not going to kill him. And then he just gets stabbed. <laughs> well, see, who saw that coming? I was shocked. Well, they stabbed him six times in the heart. Horrible, horrible people. <laughs> For the watch. Even though they were calling him a traitor, actually, they were being traitors by what they did to him. I was very upset by that. <laughs> I mean, that was dark. I found it really upsetting. He wasn't allowed a brave death. It was a tragic betrayal. He gave his life to the Night's Watch, and they repaid him uh, by killing him. Why, Night's Watch? Why did you kill him? Um, that really hurt me, it, as it did with, you know, most, most fans of the show. As Jon's watch ended, fans anguished over whether or not he would return, eagerly anticipating the start of season six. That, for me, as an actor and as a person, was the hardest secret I've ever had to keep for an entire year. I love how they left it on a cliffhanger from season five, you know, to wait a year to find out. I think it was great how they did that. It's about the Lord Commander. The former Lord Commander. Does he have to be? It was possible to bring people back, but we don't know if Melisandre can do it or anybody that's in close proximity to Jon Snow is able to, to do that. I never had this gift. Have you ever tried? You can see it in her face that she, this god that she's believed in for many years, she's starting to 
kind of disbelieve in. And so it's a conflicted Melisandre that carries the hopes and dreams of everyone. The series, like, naked body just laid out with cuts and bruises. It was really a lot to take in, a lot to take in. And Persis and Kir Persis. And Morchot Glaison. I think she's starting to question everything that she's ever believed in. <sighs> but when her attempt fails, the viewer's agony is prolonged. That little moment of defeat that, Mel that Melisande has, you know, you see the defeat travel down from thought into hand as she thinks, no, I, I haven't been able to do this. It's lost. The brilliance of the whole sequence of everybody leaving, it, it is over. It's failed. And you're kind of thinking, well, that was a waste of time. <laughs> that was a waste of time, wasn't it? John being there with Ghost, it was, it was a nice kind of reassuring moment, the fact that he's there guarding, guarding his master, even in death. We finally realise that it's going to work when, when the wolf goes, hello. And that brilliant overhead shot of him. You just sit there hoping that it's going to happen, but I did not believe that he would come back to life. <gasps> and then it's just like that moment of just like, <gasps> And he draws breath and you're just like, yes! And he goes, what the fuck am I doing alive? <gasps> there he was, the Jon Snow has returned. There's nothing we like more than saviors coming back from the dead. When he made his vows to the Night's Watch, he was theirs until he died. And now that he's died, he's free of those vows and he can he can support whoever he wants to, and he can fight for whoever he needs to. Coming up after the break, a dragon and a wolf, a snake in the grass, and one man and his dog. Good doggy. Welcome back to Game of Thrones' greatest moments. We've already seen some corkers, and there's plenty more to come. At number 12, it's decision time for Sansa, as the Stark family reunion threatens to turn sour. Have my sister brought to the Great Hall. The Starks are finally back together, but you feel like they're about to get torn apart by Littlefinger. He's been whispering in ears and very clearly plotting something. Where did you get this? Littlefinger gave it to me. Littlefinger is so evil. You'd see him in the shadows turning up and you'd just see his little moustache. And he, was just, and he would just be there seeing him. Mm. He pretty much set in motion everything that's happening in the Seven Kingdoms right now. He thrives in chaos. And I think it's been his strongest tool in a way. And he used to own a whole house. And his latest scheme is to turn the Stark women against each other. I thought it had worked when, when Sansa called Aya into the, into the courtroom. They sowed enough doubt about Littlefinger splitting the sisters. You do believe that Arya may be in trouble at that point. They've been sparring and they've been at each other's throats since they got back, pretty much. Are you sure you want to do this? It's not what I want. It's what honor demands. Don't let this happen. They've only just got back together. Are you kidding me? You stand accused of murder. You stand accused of treason. How do you answer these charges? Lord Baelish. What? Yes! <laughs> it's that great moment where he, for once he's at a loss for words. I couldn't believe, I mean, he couldn't believe either. What I liked about it was they pulled the wool over his eyes. Oh, they had him. We've seen him continually again and again lie and betray and accuse, and suddenly, finally, the spotlight is turned on him and there's nowhere for him to run. Ah, oh, Peter, little finger. I'm a bit confused. Which charges confuse you? That was so well set up, it was so well executed, and came as a complete and total surprise. You murdered our aunt, Lysa Arryn. You pushed her through the moon door and watched her fall. Do you deny it? Sansa lays it out ruthlessly and clearly. The conflict between the Starks and the Lannisters, it was you who started it. Do you deny it? It is thrilling to see a, a, a character who's, who's been kind of put upon the whole way through start to take control. I deny it. 
None of you were there to see what happened. None of you knows the truth. My favorite moment in the trial of Baelish was when Bran gave his testimony. You held a knife to his throat. We see that shock and surprise play out on his face, and that's the nail in the coffin for him. There's no way that he can escape now. You said, I did warn you not to trust me. Bran's ability to see into the past becomes really crucial. Peter Baelish is like, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know, I didn't know you could do that. That's awkward. Uh, ah, please help me. <laughs> Sansa, I beg you. He just immediately went to begging. He just stops and just, just goes on his knees and goes, oh, no. <laughs> oh, please. You know, that kind of, like, right at the back of the throat begging. You know, when there's, there's nothing, please, this has to work. Part of Littlefinger is even when he's doing that, you still feel like he's trying to work an angle. I loved you more than anyone. He's entranced by her and maybe in love's too strong a word for Littlefinger, but he's certainly obsessed with her. And this whole fancy Sansa's mother and now fancy in Sansa, I mean, come on, dude. But Sansa is finally ready to cut herself free from her abusive protector. Sansa and Littlefinger has, has been uh, enigmatic and frequently disturbing. She was listening, she's taken all that on board, and she knows how to play a few tricks and games of her own now. The pupil becomes the master. Thank you for all your many lessons, Lord Baelish. I will never forget them. That must have felt so good. Well, Arya's got pretty ruthless, hasn't she, now? <gasps> It's a shocking death. She just slashes his throat and he's still trying to talk and all that blood is coming out on the floor. It's horrific. She watched her dad being executed and now she's an executioner. The scary circle completed there. Oh, gosh. He's finally not going to be whispering in any ears anymore. At number 11, we celebrate the unlikely and whirlwind courtship of two great leaders. Jon Snow, Daenerys, it had to happen. They're both good people, they're both doing things for the right reasons. I think they make a good power couple, but it's gonna be interesting to see who's really going to rule. I was born to rule the Seven Kingdoms, and I will. You'll be ruling over a graveyard if we don't defeat the Night King. It began with a power struggle. And they're also good, aren't they? They seem to be sort of, they're the good guys, and you sort of want them to, to, to come together and, and, and to rule the world, but they can't. It would be too perfect. Little did we know sparks were gonna fly and they were going to start, you know, finding themselves attracted to each other. And after she supported his quest to fight the dead with great sacrifice, John was smitten. She lost the dragon for him. Now, you know, his heart is involved. But this is a love story with a sting. It's just typical of the show, isn't it, that you, you've been wanting them to become lovers and you get the loving moment as you're totally given the information that it's, you're watching incest right now. It's a brilliant twist because you do, you, it's so wonderful to see the two of them come together. And then, of course, you've got this revelation that mm, they're related. The sex scene was intercut with, with, with the story being kind of like, like unearthed. What a fantastic reveal it was uh, through Bran as the medium. Bran turns love detective and reveals to us that Jon is actually the son of Rhaegar Targaryen the older brother of Daenerys. And it was like, okay, well, what's happening here? And then like, hang on a minute. Oh no, For, like, of course, yeah, incest again. You're sleeping with your now for your girlfriend. <laughs> That's the thing, because it gets even sexier. So he's having sex with his auntie, and this little brother's watching. I just, I, the whole thing was weird. How will Daenerys react when she finds out? She's got a nephew. He's got a fucking nephew, you know what I mean? <laughs> but the interesting thing is, of course, we, the viewers, have discovered this via Bran, but Jon himself doesn't know it yet. And the fact that Jon Snow is actually legitimately in line for the throne now. He's never been a bastard. 
He's the heir to the Iron Throne. They might need a lawyer present for that sit down. That's going to be a bit awkward for her. It's like, yeah, by the way, mm, it's me. It does have certain um, implications, possible implications on can he control Daenerys' dragons? Actually, he, you should be humbling yourself to him because he's the king. Oh, and by the way, he's your nephew. <laughs> It is one of the best moments of Game of Thrones. It is one of the best moments. I think a lot of cheers went up around the globe. At number 10, it's the glorious moment that Sansa plays judge, jury and executioner. Sansa. Ramsay Bolton, the stuff he did to Sansa, uh, he took psychotic nature to another level. Though defeated in battle, Ramsay is still cocky, still goading. Is this where I'll be staying now? He's got a brilliant survival instinct. Try right until the very end. And he says some really horrible things to her. Absolutely still trying to get into her head. You can't kill me. I'm part of you now. I think he had such belief in his power over her that he thought that she wouldn't be able to. But Sansa's done with being damsel in distress. She has the most incredible character arc. She starts as an innocent girl. She gets taken as a captive. Samarin. The fairy tale has been beaten from her by successive tormentors. Sansa has learned uh, some painful lessons along the way. Things aren't like she's been told in, in songs and stories that, she, that meant so much to her as a kid coming up. She escaped Joffrey and the Lannisters only to be duped into marriage with a greater monster. It's horrible what happens to her. I think it's brutal, horrible. Some pretty awful stuff at the hands of Ramsay, and finally, she and we get our revenge on him. Now Ramsay's time is up. Finally, she got control, and she was able to say, I'm a strong woman. You know, this is what you've done to me. It, it ends here. It ends here. Your words will disappear. Your house will disappear. She really has suffered a lot. And I think, she, I think her core now is as, as hard as stone. All memory of you will disappear. There was only one way to kill him and Sansa found the right way to do it. I'm thinking that is sweet. That is sweet. It shows a lot about how Ramsay's mind works. My hands will never harm me. I just think he has this weird arrogance that he just doesn't, he feels invincible. He doesn't think he can die. They're not going to eat me. They're not going to eat me. They're my dogs, yeah. They're loyal beasts. They were. Now they're starving. And then the dogs come in and you can hear the panting and the sniffing. I mean, that was just, just beautiful. And, and I've still got that image in my mind. Very fitting, I thought. Very, very fitting. <laughs> he could have turned into a whining coward, of course, but uh, it was better that he wasn't, actually. It gave him a little bit of nobility, didn't it? Stop! Stop! It's a pretty sweet moment when the, when the dog takes a chunk. Ned Stark told her, you're not allowed to turn your head, and she's, she's ruthless. She's her mother's daughter, and she's her father's daughter. She's a Stark through and through, and uh, her strength is finally coming to the fore. It's her being a Stark, but it's also her saying, power is muddy. His best friends consumed him. People all over the world are just like... Good doggy. Not long enough. Not long enough. Personally, I would have liked to see the dogs, I don't know, get down to the bone, maybe. Or from above, in a wide shot. She's a character that will surprise people because she's not what she seems. She's hardcore. She's gonna do some damage because 
She's had a nightmare. Boom! Yes, Sansa, it's your time. Let's take a break to refill our goblets and toast our enemy's demise. But do hurry back for some out-and-out -out carnage. All the characters, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. We're counting down your 25 greatest moments. Damn. From seven tumultuous seasons. A glimpse of these creatures is where it all began in season one. We see them before the titles in the very first episode. And people talk about them as if they're just mythical creatures. But we've had to wait until season five to see the White Walkers unleash their full might. At number nine, it's a big moment for the Night King. It starts oh so quietly. Jon Snow has ventured north beyond the wall to Hardhome to urge wildlings to join him. Jon Snow is trying to get all the wildlings out of there. And then we come. Shut the gate. Shut the gate. There's no way that just shutting the gate is going to keep us out. <laughs> Went from zero to 100 miles an hour in the space of a second or two. The battle scenes were just so vicious and real. It was quite savage. So during the attack, the Night's King is up high on a ridge watching it uh, with some of his commanders. Not fighting, of course. Uh, he wouldn't need to, not with his best soldiers down there. And it's now that our hero finally comes face to icy face with the enemy he fears above all others. It's the battle that we've all been waiting for. And there's this amazing fight between the pair of them. It's just his stillness, it's just how rigid he was as he jumped down. I thought, oh my God, he's terrifying. They're bursting through doors and walls and they end up outside. And I think it's very rare we see a scene uh, on anything, movie or TV, where we really don't know what's going to happen next moment, next moment. Every moment is completely unexpected. And it's that moment of realisation that the viewers have at exactly the same time as Jon Snow has. Longclaw, his sword, that Valyrian steel can kill White Walkers. That is a monumental moment in Game of Thrones because that changes everything. The Night King sees Jon kill one of his best men. He's observing what's going on. I think it's with a look of curiosity. There's a curiosity and intrigue with who this Jon Snow character is. But it is a fleeting victory. Jon Snow is about to witness the full might of his enemy's arsenal. They're not just ooh, wandering around killing. They really are battling. They're fighters. They pile and pour over the cliff like it's just this, this absolute avalanche of bodies. As soon as you see the undead pouring over the cliff face, you think this is it for everybody or they're going to put up a hell of a fight. There's real horror in that, but it, what a spectacle it was too. And then all of a sudden... They're crucial to the White Walkers. I mean, terrifying, an army that will do anything. has no fear even of death, obviously, because they're dead. I watched it about four or five times in, in the period of a week and held my breath every single time. Heavily outnumbered, 1-1 one, one, the Giant smashes a path for John and the Wildlings to escape. He just picked up the biggest flaming log he could and started using it. <laughs> hitting, hitting whatever he could as fast and as hard as he could. Then, as John is forced to beat a retreat, old Blue Eyes ventures down for his curtain call. That great moment at the end where I raised my arms, uh, when I read that in the script, it gave me goosebumps. It's a great moment. It's a, one of the greatest moments I think I've ever been involved in. He very deliberately is looking at Jon Snow and he does 
this. Come at me, bro, kind of moment where he raised his hands. It was oh, amazing, absolutely amazing. Well, what more terrifying thing can you see than a whole new army suddenly come from the bunch you just killed? It's a challenge to John, and uh, look what I can do. How do you fight that? He's seen the real enemy, and there's a lot of them, and they're coming. You don't have a chance. If you're going to deal with Cersei, you've got to take her out. High Sparrow wanting to have this whole trial to get her to be judged. That's just not happening. That's not happening. You saw her walk of shame. At number eight comes the Exocet payback. You know, you make her walk naked through the street, you kind of have to watch her back. To be prepared for her to strike back. Cersei's meant to go to her trial. You see Tommen looking really nervous. Marjorie getting ready. It's just so elegant and so intelligently structured. They are the bells of doom. It's like a heartbeat banging against our eardrums. It's, it's daunting. Gathered in the High Sept to the Tyrell family and High Sparrow. In fact, all who have crossed Cersei. Then the no-shows begin. Tommen wanting to leave. I'm late for the trial. The Iron Giant that's like, no, not going, kid. Even he must have known at that point that something was up. And there's only one person who could construct something, and that would be his mother. Once the Queen Mother's trial is concluded, Brother Loras is free to leave. And where is the Queen Mother? A high Sparrow obviously didn't know who he was dealing with. Go to the Red Keep and show her the way. That whole moment when Lancel spots the kid. The score as it gets sort of operatic. And the creepy kids. Killing Pycelle. I was just riveted, and I was riveted by every aspect of it. Beautiful. That whole moment was beautiful. That quiet menace that she had. Love her. Love her. Hate her. Love her. But also, everyone in the sept, as they gradually started to realize there's something wrong. Marjorie knows what's up in an instant. Cersei's very clever. Um, she was always going to have a way out. The trial can wait. We all need to leave. And that was when my stomach was like, oh, man. She always was going to have some sort of dastardly plan. Because we're told it's by fire, we accept it is. Of course, the flame is green. It's, it's another brilliant invention. There's fire. But there's wildfire and wildfire explosions. It's just worse. I got goosebumps, actually. The moment they wouldn't let her leave, that's when everything got settled and she was like, oh, here we go. Oh, man. This is going to go down. That was Brilliant. The Lannisters, they do revenge in a big way. It's Rewenge plus. Bravo, bravo. Pure victory, isn't it? Pure victory. And I think maybe after that, she thinks she's unstoppable. But her victory has a terrible price. She thinks Tommen's still safe up in his bedroom. She's wiped out pretty much all of her enemies in King's Landing. She loves it, and she's just drinking wine, big smirk on her face. She's a bad mother. She's a bad mum. <laughs> I didn't... 
I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming. The king is dead, but now it's long live the queen. She accepts very swiftly her fate once she loses her final child. Absolutely gutted about Joffrey, like inconsolable, then really, really upset about her daughter. And Tommen was a bit like, oh, well, now I'm queen. It doesn't matter the nature of the behavior, the fact that a woman has managed to achieve that position and get that much power against all the odds. If Tywin had been around, he would probably have been reluctantly proud. You best buy a new hat, because after the break, it's wedding season in Westeros. A royal wedding is not an amusement. Welcome back to our celebration of death and destruction across the Seven Kingdoms as we count down your 25 greatest moments. One of the, the ongoing themes, I think, in Game of Thrones is, you know, you're happy to see somebody's comeuppance, but at the same time, nobody would wish that on their worst enemy. I think everybody who watches Game of Thrones was hoping this day would come. There must have been great cheering across the realm the day that Joffrey died. At number seven, it's the wedding, which is everybody's happiest day. Except for the bridegroom, he won't make it to the last course. Very good, very good, off you go. I love the people that you hate. <laughs> he was so good at what he did, he just made you despise him so hard. I've never hated anyone as much as I've hated Joffrey. A gold dragon to whoever knocks my fool's hat off. I hate you so much. I, 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 I want you to live and do more stuff so I can hate you for longer. Probably one of, if not the greatest television villain um, of all time. He's a bully. He's a miserable kid with absolute power. Everyone, silence! Just when you think that it can't get any more ridiculous and he can't be any more rude and awful. He then brings on his dwarf show. I give you King Joffrey, <laughs> Renly, Stannis. It's awful because you wa you're watching him being a total ass and nasty and, you know, all that, you know, the, the theatre play that he puts on beforehand. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Marjorie's just playing that game of Joffrey. <laughs> She's playing up to it and going, yeah, I love it when you kill loads of things or when you do your weird stuff. Uncle, you can be my cupbearer, seeing as you're too cowardly to fight. Your grace does me a great honor. It's not meant as an honor. The way he treats Tyrion is totally despicable. He sees it as an opportunity to wield his power because he can. You know, be my cupbearer, pick that up. The way he treats Tyrion and everybody at that table, he's just hideous. I said, Neil! The kind of evil that Joffrey and, and the kind of pain that he'd inflicted on everyone, on Sansa, on Tyrion, on, on all uh, people in his family, the, the whole lot, he needed, he needed to be punished. <laughs> After three and a bit seasons of Joffrey's evil antics, his chickens, or in this case pigeons, have finally come home to roost. My hero. He was pushing it far too far, but then of course then you realise why. It's because they're setting it up for this wonderful moment where he, he begins to choke. <laughs> There's nothing. <laughs> He's choking! Oh, poor boy! When I saw it, I saw how brilliant it was. It wasn't a slashing of a throat, it wasn't anything like that. He didn't have his hand cut off or anything like that. It was a very, 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 very painful 45 seconds for him. <laughs> well, the death of Joffrey was really exciting. <laughs> I thought it was absolutely magnificent because it obviously really hurt. Jack Leeson did an incredible job with that scene. The look in his eyes, it gave the scene a, a poignance. I was like, why was it, why wasn't he punished longer? Why was it so short?
Maybe we weren't meant to be satisfied by his face turning purple and Cersei weeping over the corpse of her dead son. And it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Personally, I would have liked his death to have been slightly more drawn out. I mean, it must have been painful and he did bleed from the eyes, but you know, you could have given me another full minute of Joffrey, you know, choking on his own blood. I would have been happy with that. At number six, it's the moment where Daenerys throws a surprise barbecue for the Lannisters. It just reminded you of why you really want dragons. After sacking Highgarden and stealing all its gold, the Lannister loot train is homeward bound, ready to pay their debts. It starts off so, so sort of slow and, you know, peaceful with Jamie and Bronn chatting. Listen. Bronn first hears the noise of the Dothraki. And the horses come over the hill with the Dothraki and you think, oh, wow. Yes, yeah, she Jamie going. Oh shit! Get back to King's Landing. I'm not abandoning my army. You're the commander, not a damn infantry man. It's the moment where you go. I told you so. <laughs> Only a fool would take on the Dothraki in an open field. The screaming hordes of Dothraki. Spears! Those poor Lannisters, I really wanted to feel for them. I wanted you to know that they were the best kind of Roman army. They were organized and they were strong. And then those Dothraki come. Well, it's alarming. I mean, that lot comes over the hillside, you know, hundreds of them whooping and yelling. They're coming at tremendous speed, slaughtering everything in their path. And that's just the Dothraki. That's without a dragon. Over the top of the hill comes this bloody dragon. They, oh my God. <laughs> what is this? Wow. That is an intense scene. Dracos! It was so bad, I actually started to feel sorry for some of the Lannister soldiers. Cause I don't think they were that aware that there was gonna be a dragon. It's just a one-two punch that these poor guys can't take. And they're running, but there's nowhere to hide because the dragon is just slaying them with, with all this fire. Daenerys attacking the train shows her cunning and her strategy. And it's a brilliant move, but it also takes her into danger. <laughs> I love Daenerys Targaryen. She's one of my favorite characters. It's almost like the further people are pushed, the more they stop thinking about the individual consequences of their actions and they start going, oh, well, maybe we're gonna have to kill all these people to get where we need to get to. When I saw Daenerys, I'm like, that's my girl. Everything literally going up in smoke. It's like bringing an F-16 to a World War I battle. You know, it's, it's true. It's, it's, it's a weapon of the future. This is one of the first times we're right down there in the middle of battle when there's dragon fire everywhere. But the Lannisters have a special weapon of their own. Carbon Scorpion is over there. Go get it then. I can't shoot with one hand. Tell you who the MVP was, Bronn. Bronn was the star of the show. Braun gets on the scorpion. Which, to be honest, looked like it should have been manned by maybe 10 people. It was so big. I'm like, I don't want Drogon to get hurt, but I don't want Braun to die. It's real edge of your seat stuff. Come on, you fucker. You care about members of both sides in that battle. <laughs> Boom. Daenerys' dragons are not invulnerable. They didn't kill him, but his bloody nearly did. When Tyrion arrives mid-battle and looks out on this incredible scene of carnage, he's all of us at home watching. He wants to root for his queen, but then his brother's down there too. 
I don't think Tyrion has been in a more difficult position in his entire story than watching Jamie during this battle. Daenerys is there next to the dragon, and then uh, Jamie Lannister sort of thinks, oh, this is my, this is the moment. Free, you idiot. You can see the pain on Tyrion's face, the fear as Jamie charges Daenerys, and what he says to him. You fucking idiot. He's terrified, and he thinks he's going to lose his brother. He's there riding, and Daenerys just looks at him, and the dragon's like, not today. It was fantastic. Jamie, what are you doing, mate? Like, I wouldn't have even done that if you had two hands. At number five, it's a cold-blooded ambush of the great and the good. I remember getting on the tube. The whole first page two and three were pictures of the Red Wedding. And everybody on that carriage was reading about that. It was amazing. I came out of the room I was in, and, uh, and I just kind of walked through it. Everyone's like, what's wrong? I was like, I've just watched the Red Wedding. We're like, we're about to go on stage. I watched it in my room, and it was pitch black. I think I went outside because I just needed sunlight. I just needed some daylight to sort of cleanse me. Having broken his pledge to marry Walder Frey's daughter, Rob Stark makes amends by offering his uncle Edmure to marry in his place. Caitlin and Rob and his wife and, and all the others, uh, nobody saw it coming. <laughs> There's almost like a, a seed of hope within her heart at that point, that possibly they've taken a turn for the better. The first moment that initiates the, the change of thought for Catelyn is the, when the band strikes up. If she was an animal and she smelled blood, this was the start of it. What is going on here? The tension is built so brilliantly in that scene. It really is. There's something not quite right. I feel I've been remiss in my duties. The more bonhomie he exudes, the better. And the, the, the hospitality and underneath is bubbling this. He can't wait for the moment. He almost taunts Caitlin, doesn't he? He knows it's about to happen. Roos gave her the weirdest, like, mm -hmm, kind of like, mm -hmm. And he's reveling in that, actually. He, uh, so that's his cruel, sadistic side. He, he knows all along as he's chatting to Caitlin before that what's going to happen. Just casually glances down at his sleeve as if saying, I dare you, go on. And she peels it back. My king has married and I owe my new queen a wedding gift. Why would you wear chainmail to a wedding? And what is the purpose of chainmail? It's to prevent you getting killed. And it all kicks off. I knew what to expect, and yet I watched it like... I was screaming at the television. Absolutely screaming at it. Just that first move. Bosh. Loads of times. No one's safe. All the characters, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. It's insane, um, everything that we've come to expect and love from, uh, from Game of Thrones. The whole goal there was for me to build it up to the point of most jocular, most happy and the most powerful moment, and then pull the rug out from under the audience and actually hit them in a way that uh, they'd be emotionally scarred by that, and that was my goal. It was a bit of like um, dinner time theater for him. It's the cruelty of it, and it's the relishing of it. And it's the fight for survival right up until the end. There's still something honorable and powerful and wonderful in that grief. Lord Walter! Lord Walter, enough! She's just visceral, isn't she? She's wild. For her, it's not even about her own life at that point. Let him go, or I will cut your wife's throat. At every stage of this scene, you think there is going to be some kind of bargain here. Maybe there's some hope, maybe there's some redemption. I'll find another. It's as easy as that for him, just as simple as that. It's just wonderfully heartless, but it has a certain 
wit about it. Mother. The Lannisters send their regards. Yeah, one of the most famous lines in the whole show. I'm just going to let you know this information just before I kill you. Um, and it's swift and it's brutal. And the only point that she goes, fuck it, is after she watches her son get killed. The horrible catawall that comes out of her, it just sticks with you. I mean, it's very real. Her resignation when she's standing there, it's just a beautiful stillness, a peace, a sort of surrender. Extraordinary TV. So much loss, so much pain. And we've got absolutely oodles more for you after the break. Ugh, it's anguish. Utter anguish. Welcome back to the cruel world of Westeros and your greatest moments from seven series. At number four, it's Aya's face off with Walder Frey. She's been waiting for such a long time. Such a long time for her revenge. The mountain. Walder's a big scalp on the orphan's kill list for hosting the Red Wedding slaughter of the Stark family. Frey. She's there. She's there at the Red Wedding. She's outside. Powerless that night, it would take three seasons of savage schooling before she'd be back to play assassin. Arya was arriving when her family were being murdered at the Red Wedding. Arya was on the back of the Hound's horse when she saw her brother's body um, topped by a wolf's head. She had to basically take this anger and keep it. And she had a lot of time to think about how she was going to do this. The faceless man gave her the power of disguise to ambush victims. Arya is one of my favorite characters. She's gone on this mad journey, becoming a badass assassin. She doesn't seem like a kid from a kind of royal family anymore. She's, she's definitely been on a different path. And now Arya's cooked up something extra special for Walder. Revenge is a dish best taken cold. And she did it coldly and calmly and coolly. And it wasn't like I've been wedged to do this. And she, she, I thought she did it brilliantly. Where are my damn moron sons? Black Walder and Lothar promised to be here by midday. They're here, my lord. You wonder if you're hearing it, and where are my sons? They're here, they're here. To get Walder Frey back in the same place, you know, where the Red Wedding took place, and to feed him his sons in a pie, that takes a lot of planning, that takes a lot of time, and that takes a lot of hatred. It's very Shakespearean, of course, as so many of these things are. They weren't easy to carve. Especially Black Walder. It really ties it up to feed him his children in the hall where her mother was killed. <laughs> it was a fantastic twist and a bit of Mission Impossible in there as well. Um, yeah, and he couldn't believe it. He was just thrown a doddery old man and he, you know, he didn't know what hit him. My name is Arya Stark. I want you to know that. The last thing you're ever going to see is a Stark smiling down at you as you die. Do it, Arya. Do it. I was delighted when Arya finally got the Walder. I wasn't expecting it, but it was like for like. There's no doubt about that. I like the fact that there was so little dialogue. He didn't get to do a, a farewell gurgling, ranting speech or anything thing about Game of Thrones, even the really good people become quite twisted and psychotic. I literally cannot wait now for her and Cersei to face off. I can't wait. 
I'd never heard the term trial by combat, but I didn't realise you could have other people fight for you. Trial by combat, you can get someone to fight for your honour. So whether you're wrong or not, as long as they win the fight, that's what matters. At three, a masterclass in the perils of taking your eye off the prize. It's the mountain and the viper. Tyrion is on trial for killing Joffrey, which we all know he didn't do, right? Tyrion's life now rests in the hands of his champion, Oberyn Martell. He's the Red Viper. He's an amazing killer. I always drink before a fight. It could get you killed. It could get me killed. But I mean, if I didn't drink, I wouldn't have been, you know, I wouldn't have been agile. Today is not the day I die. Ilaria mm. has total faith in the Red Viper, her lover's powers as a fighter. But the minute she sees the mountain, she doubts it. You're going to fight that? I'm going to kill that. With the mountain representing the crown, the odds are stacked against Tyrion. He was enormous! <laughs> I think she suddenly has a sort of a flash of what could happen, what might happen. Don't leave me alone in this world. Never. Then you've got this great little fight against this little guy who's a little bit too cocky and this giant guy who's a little bit too angry. <laughs> Have they told you who I am? Some dead man. <laughs> Oberyn has a massive grudge against the families. I'm going to hear you confess before you die. You raped my sister. You murdered her. You killed her children. Say it now and we can make this quick. <laughs> the one thing that he's ever lived for is to avenge his sister's death. And he knows that now that the opportunity is presenting itself, there is no question that he will get what he wants. And he does, kinda. Well, he moved like a snake. The whole thing was very sexy and also very terrifying. You killed her children! And he wants to expose you know, these criminals publicly. Oh, no, you can't die yet. You haven't confessed. <clears throat> That's far more important to him than killing the mountain. Say her name, Elia Martel. It was very much like David and Goliath. If David was overly cocky and didn't just get the job done. Who gave you the order? Say her name! I know you're angry about what, he, what he's done to you, your family, but please, can you stop with the spins and just, just kill him? Say her name. He just got cocky. In that last minute, he got cocky. You know, and I think the problem is, is they were cocky. <laughs> they are cocky. If this was nowadays and that was a, he would have pulled out like a selfie stick and tried to take a selfie with him, like, hey, I beat him. Like, he was doing all of that sort of stuff. By this stage, you have know very much what show you're watching, so you're expecting it not to go well for the Viper because he's talking too much. Uh, so from that point on, I thought, oh, God, just shut up, just shut up, get him, kill him. Please stop, please don't do it. Say it! Yeah. I'm like, no, oh, I just, I can't watch. I'm like, this, no, I can't believe it's going to happen. Please, please. I <laughs> yes, this smashing his head. <laughs> we all know what happens next. Oh, God, it's awful. Elia Martel. For him to actually tell me what he did to her right before he crushes my face. I killed her children. Then I raped her. It's that darkness that it sends you to bed with at night <laughs> that we all seem to love. It culminates <laughs> in a piece of excessive violence. Do you know? I mean, a man's head being squashed like a melon. Then ah! I smash her head in like this. That's quite a lot of energy. To do, to do that, that disgusting thing. And then they, they messed it up. He messed it up. And that, ah, it's anguish. Utter anguish. That's one of the fantastic deaths, I have to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're hereby sentenced to death. It wasn't the wine, it wasn't the helmet, it was the blah, blah, blah. Grab a quick snack, but come straight back because we're about to reveal the number one greatest moment in the whole Seven Kingdoms. That was the most cinematic thing I've ever seen on television. Welcome back. We're closing in on the top spot. 
But first, let's find out what you voted the second greatest Game of Thrones moment. At number two, dig deep for pain. It's the big loss of a huge fan favourite. Hodor. Hodor has been such a great, great person. He's been, he's been a great character. He's been a great servant to Bran. Obviously, Game of Thrones is a world of sort of hate and fight, and Hodor's just Hodor. It's just all for the love. It's great. He's the only innocent character there, I believe. I believe. I think he had no agenda. Hodor. It's all right, Hodor. There's a character that is wholly good and deserved absolutely nothing. Of, of what happened to him. But Hodor wasn't always known as Hodor. Willis, come here. Which we discover when Bran is taken back to Winterfell of the past by the three-eyed raven. Hodor? Not always a man of few words, he was once the Stark stable boy. If there's anyone, any character that needed uh, you know, further delving into their backstory, it was Hodor. And, and what a backstory it was. And though is it when he's going to dodge my lady? <laughs> Hodor talks. It was so compelling because we've had that, we've been tracking that relationship for so long, and those two have really been this beautiful allegiance. But while Bran is enjoying his history lesson, the White Walkers have come for him and have arrived en masse. They have evolved and they are getting bigger and stronger, and there are more of them against us, and it's terrifying. Oh, I don't like that, Night King. Does anyone like the Night King? He's a bastard. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, he's an incredible character. So scary. Get run and run! It's got action. It's got gore, it's, it's got sadness. You know, it's, it's got pretty much everything that we watched Game of Thrones for in that one moment. It is literally my favourite moment of the whole show. I mean, it's wicked and it reveals a big secret. You have to wake up! We need Hodor! 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 Bran is unaware of what's going on. Bran, we're all going to die! Bran, wake up! I think that that's just terrifying. Skeletons falling from the ceiling as White Walkers killing the Three-Eyed Raven. Leave me. One by one, Bran's companions lay their lives on the line to protect him. I felt sad for them, especially Summer. The Summer's been with us right from the start. She makes a huge sacrifice as well. It's just madness. Madness. Go! Leaf just was like, they're coming so fast that she needs something. She needs to do something to, to delay the process. She realizes that if it means that he could survive, I would do it. Everyone has basically just given in order to give way for Bran. But it is Hodor's final selfless act to ensure Bran's survival oh, no, hurry! that leaves a gaping hole in the viewers' hearts. For a lot of people, especially the real loyal fans who've been following it from series one, that payoff was a, was a huge one. I didn't realize what it was going to look like. And then when I saw it, it kind of, it kind of hit me. to get to drag my jaw off the floor because it was such a huge moment and um and that was you know real honor to be the one who who's kind of indirectly uh, you know gives hodor his name with bran simultaneously straddling two timelines he unwittingly gives willis a glimpse of his own fate altering him immeasurably by shattering his young mind the way it's shot and the way it keeps cutting into bran back with young hodor it's really traumatic. Even though I knew what was going to happen, I found it so sad. It was a completely pure act of protection. His life just becomes a circle at that point, which is an unbreakable loop in time, which is tragic. Suddenly, it's like a jigsaw moment that everything makes sense. Brilliant symmetry, brilliant symmetry. Hold the door. Hold the door. The bit where they, they sort of disappear into the snow, he realises, I think, at that moment, that's it. I mean, they've gone, I've done my job, but I'm still not going to let go. It just showed, like, just pure love. 
It was so heartbreaking, especially because Bran's really one of the one few good, innocent characters. And then it turns out that inadvertently he's caused his best friend's breakdown and then his death. Order, order, order. It doesn't get sadder than that. And now, drumroll please, it's the moment you voted number one. The ultimate northern showdown. Bastard v Bastard. This is what Game of Thrones does. It, it sucks you in. It builds up because you knew this moment was going to come. It's the classic good versus evil. Jon Snow versus Ramsay Bolton. They've always been after their father's acceptance. They've always been looked down at as being a bastard. So I think they really understand each other and they've both risen very high in the world when really the odds were against them being bastards. He invested in Jon Snow. He's died and he's come back to life. Ramsay Bolton is a crazy, evil, demented, wicked, wicked person. He's the biggest bastard of all time. I hate the character. You know, his, his presence really does overcome you, even just watching it through a screen. The thing is, is that Ramsay's a lot more cunning than John. And John's instantly outmaneuvered with Ramsay's opening gambit, setting the tone for the battle to come. Ramsay has his own way of doing things, doesn't he? <laughs> Run to your brother. But then that's the Boltons. They're not physical fighters, but they're in your mind. They're absolutely in your mind. He was deliberately missing the first four or five arrows to give the young kid and Jon Snow some hope. Zigzag, zigzag, don't shoot in arrows at you and you're running in a straight line. It cuts you off at the most passionate point. It was devastating, really devastating. It was just great to be able to be a part of something that was obviously so filled with passion and emotion. With yet another Stark lost, John realizes he's played right into Ramsay's hands and is stranded in no man's land without his army. And then he's like, well, you know what? Fuck it. And I loved that moment, that moment of realization. I'm not normally a fan of action sequences, but this was hands down my favorite bit of TV that I think I've ever seen. <laughs> It gave you a, a really amazing sense of what it's like to be John in that battle. They're ripping heads off, they're stabbing each other. Horses are coming at Jon Snow. That was the most cinematic thing I've ever seen on television. You could really understand what battle meant. You read about big battles where the bodies are piled on, piled on, piled on. And it's just like, for me, it was like a, the idea of being in a battle like that. It was just a nightmare. I'm sure a lot of people perished in that way. And then, terrifyingly, the Bolton forces outflank Jon Snow's and enact the crush. When they surrounded them and then they started crushing them, I thought, this is it. How, how, how is this going to end? This can't end in any other way. Epic, epic TV. They were being driven into the mud. Jon Snow was being suffocated under the bodies of his own men. Jon Snow is almost buried alive. He's almost trampled, and it's so fantastically shot. I don't think I've ever seen a battle done like that. It was, it was totally intimate. The, the suffocation of it. You couldn't not engage with it emotionally. The audience feels it with him. You just, you just feel like, utterly kind of claustrophobic. The mud, covered in mud, and it, it was all blurry. And I was like, well, it's over then. I don't know how he's supposed to get out of this, because I, I know that he should do, but I don't know how it's going to happen. But then when he does burst forth and take that huge gasp of breath, just as he did when he was resurrected. It's a nice little uh, mirroring there. It's him almost being reborn for a second time. And then when all hope is lost, the cavalry arrives to snatch victory from Ramsay's clutches. Sansa! I 
I think what was genius about the, that, that finale was that no one saw it coming. Jon Snow wouldn't have won the Battle of the Bastards without Sansa leading the Knights of the Vale along with Littlefinger uh, to Jon's rescue. Defeated on the battlefield, Ramsay retreats to Winterfell to cower behind the walls. But he hadn't reckoned on the might of Jon's battering ram. Hodor was famous for holding the door. One one is famous for banging them down. He knew he wasn't going to make it past that battle. But if you're going to go out, go out in a hail of arrows. After all the loss, there is one final satisfying moment as John gives Ramsay a stark reminder of who rules the North. Ramsay was eventually going to get his comeuppance. He'd lost all credibility by then and is still trying desperately to cling on to some semblance of strength in front of Jon Snow. Jon Snow just flattens him, smashes his face in. It was just a moment of pure, kind of unbridled joy, and that's not the kind of thing that Game of Thrones delivers very often. <laughs> I thought that was it for him. I thought he was going to kill him right there and then. He, he still got that wry smile on his face, which is so frustrating. He was a, a bastard to the end. Well, there you have it, the 25 greatest moments. The good, the bad and the ugly, just the way you voted for them. Queens squared off, whispers were silenced. And a dragon was lost. And now, like all of Westeros, we wait for the glorious coming of season eight. The end is nigh, I know, but the good news is you can start it all over again and watch the first seven seasons of Game of Thrones with Sky On Demand.